Great. Hey, thank you so much for the introduction and what a fantastic array of, of content today. Uh, I thought I'd start and comment. I'm actually taking this talk from our workshop. This is not a, uh, I know segmentation has come a long way since I used to work on it, but this is not a background segmentation. Uh, so I thought it'd be fun to, to speak here in our, our workshop. So hello from, from London. So to, to dive in, I think now is the time for us as a community to bring embodied agents out of simulation, out of the virtual world, and really give them an, an embodied uh, intelligence, a presence in the physical world. And I really see a vision of embodied agents uh, interacting with us to really enrich our lives across all of society uh, and doing so in a way that doesn't take away our agency, but really allows us to focus on what matters most. And so Wave, we're building this starting with autonomous driving. If you think about current solutions to autonomous driving, I think there are two key reasons that are really holding us back, adaptability and scalability. If you look at AV 1.0, the first generation of autonomous driving technology, I think it was really brute force to a solution through HD maps and hand-coded rules. And this is super inspiring to me and I'm sure many of you, um, but what we've seen is it really struggled to adapt to the, the complexity of, of urban environments and, and others that, that you or I uh, likely need to, to move around in this world. On top of that, we've seen a, a reliance on really expensive and complicated sensor stacks that I, I think more have the, the idea of, for each new edge case, put a new sensor in place to resolve that, rather than really focusing on the underlying intelligence. And then perhaps most importantly, um, the future of mobility needs a complete array of, of solutions from micro-mobility to public transport, um, uh, to, to ride hailing, to delivery. And I think we need to be able to iterate and adapt to these different vehicle platforms uh, with speed and, and move at the pace we're used to moving at with hardware as we are with software. Um, and, and I think that this really requires a, a super advanced level of adaptability. That's what we're focusing on and, and really looking to reimagine what's possible and move us to AV 2.0, what we consider the next generation of autonomous driving and doing so with N2 and deep learning. Let me show you an example just to, to set the scene of what we're able to demonstrate with this technology. This is our system driving in central London, uh, fully under full automation through a quite unstructured and unknown scene. It's never seen this intersection before. It doesn't have an HD map. In fact, I challenge you to actually describe where the, where the lanes are in this kind of unstructured environment. But our system is driving through that through there with entirely online reasoning uh, with, with machine learning from monocular computer vision. Here again, we're driving in quite a heavy rainstorm uh, in London in, in fairly heavy traffic. And I just wanted to show this to, to give you an idea of some of the diversity of scenes that, uh, that we learn to drive in across many different types of weather, many different types of road environments. Uh, and you know the, the, the size of the state space is, is really enormous. And, um, uh, and you know, it's quite exciting when you first get in the vehicle to see this in the real world. This example is driving in central London down Oxford Street. If you've visited, many of you may know it as the main shopping district in London. Uh, and this just gives you an example of, of what our system has been able to learn and generalize to. If I skip forward in this video, um, this is my favorite moment because here is what I would consider real multi-agent interaction and control. And this, this is what's needed for autonomous agents to coexist with humanity. We can't have an autonomous vehicle that just stops and waits for the traffic to clear before proceeding. We need to be able to jointly predict how we're behaving uh, and others behave. And in this example, you can see our vehicle essentially predict how others are gonna move around it and know jointly how it should uh, move its way through this, this very busy traffic. Know when, uh, when it's gonna move and nudge others out of the way, or in this example, know when someone's going to come in in front of us. And, I would really challenge you to define where the lanes are there. Uh, that, was, that, that really does motivate the need for a high dimensional state representation of the world and the ability to control from it. Um, and in this final example, here's a, uh, here's a red light intersection in an urban area and uh, our systems learned to stop. Uh, it hasn't been told the exact XYZ location of the light, it's just detected it um, through end-to-end -end reasoning. And then when it goes green, it knows to drive through and has noticed that there's an offset to the following lane and it's able to correctly navigate around and drive through this. So I think this is, uh, I think this is more starting to look like the future for me. And um, just to show one final example, here's again, some very busy traffic, oncoming traffic that 
Uh, we've got to navigate through past double, double park vehicles. And if you try and code up the rule book the, the, of the road code, I think you'll find many, many times that these rules need to be bent or flexed to be able to interact with society as, as driving cultures dictate. And that's really motivating why we think we need to learn to get to these sort of complex environments. To talk about scalability, uh, just to show one, uh, one other result here, we trained that agent with about 5,000 hours of London-based driving data. We can take it all over the UK. So for example, we've taken it to Cambridge, a city uh, a couple of hours drive from London. And this model has been able to drive with a similar uh, set of performance metrics, despite having never seen that environment before. Now, what I see for the system is when we go from UK cities to Paris, Tokyo, uh, Mumbai, as we go to more and more diverse sets of driving cultures, I think we'll need exponentially less data to go to each one, but really build this underlying driving intelligence that can adapt across these, across these driving domains. That's what I think is the future. Let me share a bit about how we build this driving intelligence. So to, to set the framework up, our system has a state input, which is based on monocular cameras that surround our vehicle, six of them, uh, along with GNSS, basic sat-nav map, and a vehicle state like uh, odometry, IMU data, and, and the like. This is about 10 to the eight dimensions when you consider those, the, those cameras and against time. And our output state is a motion plan, about 10 to the one dimensions, uh, which has a parameterized motion plan, which you can do in many ways, uh, as well as vehicle controls like, like indicator control. How do we tend to solve very complex high dimensional problems? Well, I don't think there's a better technology on the planet than deep learning. And so what we do is we put an end to end network in this place to model from that high dimensional input to the low dimensional output. And we learn end to end to optimize this model. And of course, we can also take a number of intermediate representations, not bottleneck representations, but decoded representations to give us some structure and interpretability in this model and to give us data efficient learning. Everything from semantics, motion, and geometry. Uh, and these, we, we, we really strive to make as self-supervised as possible. How do we train it? Well, we've built a fleet learning platform that really gives us large scale training and verification. Um, we're able to put petabytes of data into this fleet learning platform to, to learn to drive at scale, everything from synthetic data to off policy data that's, that's really important to build up that robust uh, world model of, of the driving dynamics. And also, of course, on policy data, uh, we have over 100,000 disengagements that we've collected to date. And uh, this gives us a really powerful platform for learning. The largest autonomous driving operations in urban environments in Europe. We see all of the, the applications, whether it's across uh, the use case or the city or the vehicle platform, all of these are just examples of different data distributions. And it's really important to us that our system can adapt across all of them and build an underlying uh, adaptable driving intelligence. So now that uh, I've talked about the platform, let me talk about a couple of threads of, of ideas that we've been pursuing over the last couple of years um, that have been really important to us. The first one is on learning temporal and 3D uh, ge geometric representations for driving. This comes from a large body of work that, that we've been pursuing for some time, and I'll put some references here if any of you want to read further or understand uh, where and how and why we came to these conclusions. To motivate this, uh, let me start by showing you this image. How many of you would think that this car on the left is yielding to us, or how many of you think it's going to, to pull out in front of us? I don't know what you think, but it's really hard to tell from a single image. And as soon as I give you motion, it becomes apparent that this car is, uh, is, is waiting and is stationary, is yielding. So this illustrates the importance for temporal context and decision making. What we've been able to put together is a system that gives us 3D reasoning in an end-to-end -end model that can also, uh, also understand the temporal state and jointly predict our motion and others' motion uh, in, in this 3D space. And this has led to some of the results I showed earlier of driving robustly and doing multi-agent interaction and in traffic. Let me walk you through some of this work. So how do we construct this architecture? First of all, we start with uh, a number of historical state inputs and we lift them into 3D. We then project them into high dimensional bird's eye view and form a sequence of, uh, of past states. You can then aggregate these into a temporal state S using a temporal model. And you, know, you can use uh, anything from a, um, 
a conditional convolutional network to a recurrent net to a transformer. I mean, we've tried them all and you can probably guess what works best. We then form two probability distributions, the present and the future distribution. The present distribution is conditioned on all of our previous state inputs and the future distribution gets to see the future states. Of course, this is only present during training time um, and we use it to guide the system to predict the future that is actually observed in the data so we can learn from it. Um, but at, at inference and test time, we don't have access to the future distribution. So we train a present distribution and minimize the divergence loss between these two in order to, to learn a, uh, an accurate and representative present distribution that can then predict the future. We then unroll these states uh, into future states over time, and then we can decode them into the outputs we care about, everything from semantic segmentation um, to depth, geometry, uh, pick, pick, your, pick your choice. Now, to give you a bit of insight behind this architecture, and if we ablate some of these components, so I started off by claiming that it's really important to have 3D geometry and temporal reasoning. Well, this ablation really shows that. If we remove the ability to reason over temporal states, um, we get a large hit in performance. And I should mention that this is looking at numbers across the future video panoptic quality metric. So panoptic quality, the quality of our um, uh, instance and semantic segmentation in five seconds in the future. Without temporal uh, uh, knowledge, we have a large hit in performance. And again, without a 3D transformation, we have a similar hit in performance. So these two factors are really important. Um, if you look at unrolling uh, or going from a deterministic to a probabilistic um, policy, we again get, get some further benefits in performance. But this gives you an idea of, of what is really important to make this work. And, and, and we've found it really was the 3D structure and the temporal reasoning. To show you some more results, uh, what you're seeing here is our system uh, able to predict multimodal and diverse futures of all the agents around us. So you can see it uh, jointly predicting agents in front of us with some multimodal uh, decisions going into this uh, intersection until they commit to a turn. Here's another one you can see where our system's able to predict a U-turn uh, in Going, in, uh, going into this intersection, you can see that the agent in front of us, it's unsure whether it's going to go straight or make a U-turn until, uh, until it commits that turn and then the uh, distribution collapses on that behavior. Here's another example that shows with 3D geometry, we're robust to quite, uh, quite dynamic ego motion. And as our vehicle turns, you can see that we're able to um, robustly reason across some of the other agents in the intersection uh, around us. And then finally, here's an example, overtaking some double parked cars and, uh, and, and driving, down, uh, driving down a lane. So that's a start. That shows an idea of, of world modeling with 3D geometry in motion. The next step is how can we actually action condition this model so that we can, uh, we can learn to drive? And so the next thing I wanna talk about is, is moving towards model-based reinforcement learning, which we think is the future and how we're going to learn a robust, uh, a robust and scalable driving, and, uh, driving agent from off-policy data. I've again listed some, um, uh, some works that have motivated this, both from our work and some other seminal work in this area. Uh, if you want to read further, please, please dive into these references. Um, a lot of great papers that inspired us there. So how can we extend this model to, to learn from uh, learn from, from data and learn to, to imagine and, and control our, our vehicle. Well, again, we can take a state input and encode it into a latent representation Z. We can decode that into a output representation we care about, such as semantics, motion, or geometry. We can take this hidden state uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and learn a dynamics model that's able to uh, learn to take the hidden state and the action that was taken and predict the next state. Now, this dynamics model, um, the, the, the important thing here is that we're learning from observ observations. So we can take large scale off policy data. If you have to learn from online data or online learning, you're gonna be very limited by the number of robots you have. But by learning from off policy data, we can observe uh, as much data as we can get our hands on. And that's, um, you know, that's truly very large scale and we can learn some very complex representations. So this is observing um, offline off policy data. We then take, so we take that state action pair and we learn a dynamics model to predict the next state. And then of course, we can look at the next observation and encode that and again, form this uh, divergence loss between our present and future distributions. 
And this gives us that ability to learn a multimodal and probabilistic representation that's so important in driving to deal with the quite diverse behaviors that we see. So again, we can learn to, to predict an output and, and roll this forward recurrently. Then when it comes to learning to control, again, we have this encoding, um, encoding framework, but now instead of using the observed actions, we can now predict our own action. And this is where we imagine to act. This is very similar to how uh, we as humans learn to drive, uh, also learn to, learn to behave. I mean, if you, if you go to kick a football, uh, you might try in n number of times in the real world, but your hippocampus will replay this many times in your mind uh, to essentially imagine and ablate the different parameters so that you learn a robust control policy through your, your neuromotor control. Now, we can do the same thing in machine learning, which is what we do here. We take this encoding and take an action and learn, uh, we, we learn to output an action and we can then use our, our dynamics model and learn to predict the next state and run this forward recurrently. And this lets us use an action that we've learned, whether it be through um, distribution matching, adversarial imitation learning, imitation learning or, or through a reward, you can learn a policy um, and you can actually unroll it through time and start to get closed loop um, driving and closed loop ability to, to, to learn and interact with the world from uh, off policy data. And this imagining to act is a really powerful idea. Let me show you some results. So as you saw previously, you saw an, a number of animations of our system predicting the future in a static sense. Well, now we're predicting futures that are conditioned on our own policy or our own action. So let me explain these videos. On the left in the first one, you can see a base, uh, a base policy where we have a, uh, in this case, a view of the world, a perspective projection looking forward and a control policy that just drives down this road and makes a, a left turn. Now, if we uh, augment this policy, let's say we turn it to zero speed, you can see in the middle example, we've learned to stay stationary. Or on the right example, you can see if we now multiply that policy by 1.5 speed, you can see our vehicle drives forward, goes a bit too fast, so drifts to the right-hand side of the road before correcting and driving back. And so you can see how it will behave under different policies. And we've got now a world model that can imagine and be conditioned on action. To show you another example, here is some multimodal and diverse behaviors. So I mentioned how it's why it's so important to get that probability distribution. So here you can see that we've been able to predict different multi-agent behaviors. So on the left, you can see a car approach us from the left of the intersection. In that middle video, you can see an oncoming car come past us. And on the right, you can see uh, much less traffic in the environment. And so this lets us really um, predict the diverse or the, the distribution of futures that is possible so that we can learn to make a safe action. And then finally, which is really important uh, from an optimization perspective is we've been able to learn over a long time horizon. Uh, you can see here really stable and robust recurrent future prediction, this, in this case over uh, more than 12 seconds, which given such, we've got such high dimensional state input, I think this is, this is really exciting so that you can cover not just the simple actions, but the complex multi-agent interaction that you need for urban driving. So let's look to the real world. What happens when you put this actually on a vehicle? Uh, I think this is, this is really exciting when I sat in the car. Let, let me show you some logs from the last couple of weeks. So in this example, we've got a double-decker bus coming towards us. And you'll notice, if I just restart this video, you'll notice our car knows to stop and actually wait because it can see and predict that this car, this bus is gonna come in front of us and enter our lane. So it knows we've had to stop and wait to let it pass. But now once it's passed, our car knows it should be nudging forward to actually make its way through traffic. And you can see this blue car and the following um, sedan sort of move out of our way to let us through. And it's that kind of multi-agent control. And for me, that's really high level reasoning and the ability to predict over a long time horizon that gives us this intelligence. Uh, and I think that's pretty exciting. So let me, let me just play it one more time. So we've stopped, we've let this, we've anticipated this double-decker bus is going to come into our lane in, a, in an unstructured sense. And then we know that we need to nudge forward and uh, actually jointly be able to predict how our behavior and others' behaviors is going to interact to be able to get through this traffic scene uh, so we're not blocked off. And then uh, I, I, I can keep playing this. Our, our vehicle will continue. Um, we're going to drive through a traffic intersection. Let me just jump forward to, I think there's another moment that's worth looking at here. So you can see here, we've, we've learned to slow down and we can predict this pedestrian crossing at the, at the zebra crossing, wait for them to leave before continuing on. So it's 
Um, this kind of multi-agent prediction is, is really important when you get to complex urban driving scenes like what we have in London. Let me show you another example. Uh, in, this, in this demo, maybe this motivates why we should not be relying on HD maps, um, because here we're gonna find a traffic light, but this traffic light is transient. It's been put there uh, through roadwork scenarios. And so our car can reason about the scene and know that it should stop. Uh, and, and, and wait, even, oh, even though human, another human disobeyed the light and drove past. But if I keep going um, into the future, so that traffic light is put there by, um, by roadworks. We don't know it's there uh, a priori, but we've been able to reason that there is a traffic light here. It makes sense. It's not, you know, uh, it, it actually is something we need to, to obey as a vehicle. Um, and I think it should go green shortly. Not only when it goes green, in the UK, we drive on the left. And so you're not allowed to go on the right, but we know our system's able to reason here that it should break that rule and actually go on the right-hand side of the road to be able to travel through this, this roadwork scenario. And so here you can see we're driving on the right to get through this, uh, um, what looks like a, a underground mains uh, roadworking scenario um, before then again to returning to the left-hand side of the road and continuing to drive. So there's just another example where uh, we need a system that can really reason in a complex manner that deals with multi-agent interaction and knows um, those rules beyond what they're written in the rule book, but really how they're applied in complex driving scenarios. So uh, I guess, let, 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 me, um, let me finish by going through what we see as some grand challenges for autonomy. I'd like to talk through these because um, we see them as, as some fundamental challenging problems for us to solve to be able to get this technology be proliferated through society. And I share them because uh, hopefully they can motivate some of your own work. Uh, and, and, and also if, if you share our passion for them, then maybe there's opportunity for us to collaborate. But we have seven grand challenges that, that we think about at WAVE. And uh, let me go through them. So the first one we've spoken a lot about today is adaptability. This is the problem of being able to adapt very quickly to different sensors, vehicle platforms, um, use cases. And, uh, and why this is so important is because it, it's not just about getting autonomous driving to, to the world to market, but dealing with the ever-changing um, ever society. It's, yeah, it's not just about getting it there, but then maintaining it over time as, as needs adapt, whether it's different road rules, a policy change, uh, or, or different vehicle platforms that are needed for, um, for what we value as, as, as consumers. For me, this is, this is so important that we have a system uh, that can do this. And the key challenges here are things like being able to do online 3D reasoning. Can you estimate your intrinsics and extrinsics so you don't have to go through some um, detailed calibration step each, each time you want to deploy a vehicle? Can you, uh, yeah, can, can, you, can you reason about dynamics online uh, or can you learn a, a really robust um, representation? Off-policy learning uh, is, is key, and we talked a, bit, a little bit about that with the dynamics models, but we need to move away from a world where we need to uh, design and develop with on-road testing. We've seen many people in this industry build safety cases through millions of miles of on-road testing, and, and while there's certainly merit to that, I think we can do something more intelligent, where can we move to a world where you can um, train, validate, and deploy through an over-the-air update and, and update your autonomy on a daily or a weekly basis. And to do that, you really need a robust and reliable off-policy training and evaluation metric. This lets you unlock very scalable data sources. You know, we just use cameras today and um, you can deploy that, that kind of sensing framework on very large scale fleets. And so uh, to be able to just use off-policy learning and evaluation, I think is what's really going to unlock, uh, unlock scale. World modeling is, is something we spend a lot of time on and is an area that I think is, is so important uh, to be able to deal with, with uh, interactions with humanity, understanding complex dynamics worlds with joint, both prediction and planning. You can't do them separately because they really do need to interact and you need to reason about that interaction. Um, something I've spoken a lot about in this talk. Uncertainty is close to, to my heart. It's a, a topic that I've, I've worked on personally and um, is really important from a, a I guess, a, a learning, a data curriculum and a, and a, a, a evaluation perspective. But not only that, but it's also important when we're actually running an inference because we need to know, is our control policy safe to execute? Uh, not only about building a safety case to deploy it, but when it's actually running on the vehicle, is the motion plan that we output 
really safe and, and valid for us to, to execute on the road. We have a unique uh, opportunity here because we rely on a, a deep learning representation where we can take things like epistemic or model-based uncertainty, we can take Q values, things like that out of our model and you really use them to verify and, and validate our, um, our vehicle's proposed trajectory before going and executing on the road. So knowing when we're out of distribution or when there's a scenario that's, that we can't handle, um, that's really important for, for safety. Interpretability uh, is another key one of how can we, how can we get a disentangled uh, orthogonal linear representation of the factors we care about. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely critical to, um, to be able to, I guess, from an engineering perspective, and as well as building trust and, and making a trustworthy system. This is something that there has been a lot of progress uh, in, the, in, in our community in the last few years. I think you know, people are, are less interested these days in chasing another nine on, on leaderboards and Cityscapes or Kitty or one of these uh, offline data sets. But now it's about how can we understand and interpret and, and, uh, and build a robust representation. Generalization is, is the next one. By this, I mean, it's likely intractable to, coll uh, to collect a, a training example in every single enumeration of our state space. We need to be able to learn a system that can be really, really robust. And by that, I mean, uh, be, able to, to, um, be, able, be able to be intelligent at states that are far from our training set and effectively reduce that outer distribution set of states to as, as small as possible. Um, and and to, so I, I think the motivation should be clear in terms of how diverse and, and uh, dynamic our world is. And then finally, the most important piece uh, is what are we trying to optimize here? What is the reward? Uh, if you think about a human feedback or a, a five-star rating at the end of a, a journey or a delivery, you know, that's a really sparse level of feedback. Not one that can provide you with, a, well, at least today's technology, uh, I think it's, it's very hard to learn from such a sparse level of feedback uh, with, with a reasonable amount of data. So how can we build a more dense reward? How can we use ideas like um, distribution matching, preference learning, inverse reinforcement learning, the interventions that we have or other heuristical factors that we might think about like um, minimizing acceleration and jerk and, and, uh, and actually progress in a journey. Um, bring all of these things together in a scalable and robust reward. That doesn't mean we've just gone from you know, feature engineering to architecture engineering to reward engineering. I think that is again, going down the slippery slope of trying to enumerate rules, but how can we actually rely on things like self-supervision, um, uh, scalable feedback, automatic feedback of our system to, to give a scalable uh, optimization objective? I think that's, that's really critical to, to figure out. So let me conclude. I firmly believe that the way that we're going to uh, solve autonomous driving is by framing this as a problem that can be solved by data, by building a really large scale data source and by building a driving intelligence that's, that's flexible enough to learn the complexities of, of the environment we're trying to operate in. Put those two together with a very large fleet learning platform. And for me, that's what's gonna produce, uh, produce autonomy in AV 2.0. And that's what, we've, that's what we're um, absolutely focused and thrilled to be working on at WAVE. Hey, so uh, this is some of our team here in our, uh, here in our HQ in London. Um, uh, all of this work here is, I'm absolutely proud to work with this bunch and it's, it's all a reflection of the hard work and, and uh, perseverance that, uh, that our whole team has, has put together over the last few years. So I wanna thank them all uh, and I feel privileged to work with them in, every day. And hey, if you share our vision or have any questions about this talk that aren't answered today, feel free to get in touch. Here's our, our contact address and, and we'll be happy to, happy to respond.